We'll learn about ocean observations, ocean theory and modeling, and how the combined information can be used to understand how the ocean evolved in the past, what is happening today, and how it will look into the future. Now, observing the ocean has been done since more than 200 years. At the end of the 19th century, the age of great discovery, sailors and explorers went out on big ships cruising across the oceans. And for example, the Enterprise, Endurance, the Meteor, other big names of ships went across the oceans, stopped usually at noon, took soundings into the ocean, recorded the temperatures, salinities, and they're really trying to understand to get a first idea how the ocean currents look like, how the temperature works, how the salinity works. Today, Mojib, we go on research vessels. These are larger ships, 50 meters long, 80 meters long, 120 meters long. Some of them are icebreakers, some of them are polar vessels. We'll take 20 people uh, to go on these ships and take modern measurements. We have high-tech instruments with us. Some of them can go from the top to the sea floor in 6,000 meter depths. Sometimes we just measure along as we are cruising along with the research vessels and we can measure again the temperatures, salinities, current, oxygen, and so on. But there's only so many ships we have. So how can we enhance our footprint? Well, we use robots. So robots are the exciting new ways to explore the oceans. We have profiling robots which can go up and down in the water column. They can do that every day or every 10 days and they measure temperature, salinity, pressure, oxygen, and when they come to the surface, they relay the data back to home. And we have, for example, in the Argo system, 4,000 of these robots in all of the ocean basins. Now, these robots are complemented with satellite systems. So satellites are encircling the globe. They can take measurements of the sea surface height, of the salinity, of the currents. And together, we really build up what we call an ocean observing system that allows us to understand how the ocean evolves and how it changes. But can we also simulate the ocean? Yes, Martin, we can simulate the ocean and we have to simulate the ocean because the oceans are huge and you can't really go everywhere. You can't measure every corner of the ocean. So you need a kind of coherent picture, a large scale global picture of the oceans and this is uh, what we do by means of ocean models. So ocean models are nothing that you can put on a table here, okay? So these are virtual, virtual models. Uh, and uh, the ocean is a physical system, okay? And as a physical system, it obeys the physical laws, the fundamental physical laws, and these laws can be expressed by mathematical equations, okay? And uh, these equations, however, are so complex, uh, so tough to solve, that uh, we can't just simply write down the solution to these equations, okay? And here we get a lot of help from supercomputers because what we do is we approximate the ocean, we cover, cover it by a mesh, and at each point of this mesh, we approximately solve the equations, okay? Now, if you assume uh, that the distance between two points of the mesh is on the order of, say, 50 kilometers, and if you do it in, in, in many layers of the ocean, uh, then you can imagine how much calculations you have to do, okay? And you can't do it only with big computers because, you know, we are simply too slow. And uh, so with the aid of the big computers, uh, we can solve the equations and then we can actually compute the development of the ocean currents, of the ocean temperatures, of the ocean salinities, oxygen, and so on. And now the problem, of course, is how can we marry what you do and what I do? So let's talk about that marriage a little bit. So I guess you try to take big computers and simulate the ocean. And now what I do is sometimes I take satellite data and say, how well is he doing? Right? So we check what the model says and we compare it with satellite data and we see, is it matching up? Or I take my observational data from the field when we go out on the ships, measure currents and say, is the current that I discovered already in your model system? So and today we're learning a bit on how we do weather forecasting. So I think we're taking the ocean observations that we have and try to put them together with the computer systems, try to marry these data. And I think because of that, we have an initial condition, as we say, and we can advance that initial condition and see how the ocean evolves. And we can always feed in data as we have them. And I think in that way, get a better picture of how the ocean actually has evolved with the sparse measurements that we have, 
together with theory and modeling, I think we get a nice trajectory of how the ocean is evolving jointly together. Also, I think what we can do, we can use the theoretical understanding to plan observations to make them more efficient, to make them better. And I think that's a big topic in what we do in planning our ocean observing. What do we really need to look at things like changing of the temperature, sea level rise, maybe the acidification of the ocean, also ocean ecology. But then in some ways, Mujib, so what are the main results that we get out of this joint marriage between observations and models? So what can we do? Can we predict the ocean? Well, we can predict the ocean, uh, but uh, normally the ocean is part of a more sophisticated system, and we call this system the climate system, because the ocean is only one part of the climate system, so we have the atmosphere, you know, we mostly experience the changes in the atmosphere, not necessarily the changes in the ocean, although uh, the ocean may drive the changes in the atmosphere. So a climate model carries the ocean, carries the atmosphere, and carries the sea ice, so the floating ice uh, on, on, on the water. And so with these data you give me, with this initialization as we say, okay, uh, we can actually predict the future. And we do this uh, on different timescales, okay, on the short timescale. So if you predict months ahead, the classical example is El Nino, okay? So this huge warming of the equatorial Pacific, which has global climatic consequences, but also consequences for the ecology of the oceans and, and you know, the economies of, of, of several countries. Now that's one thing, that short term, then uh, we know that there are currents like the Gulf Stream, like the Kuroshio in the, in the Pacific, and uh, these currents vary on somewhat longer time scales, on decadal time scales, and we can also try to make predictions of these decadal fluctuations, and then in the long run, climate change comes into play. But there we also need an assumption about how the composition of the atmosphere will change, especially how CO2 in the atmosphere uh, will evolve. So we have to prescribe a certain scenario, a certain greenhouse gas scenario, as we say, and then use our initialized models to predict, say, 50 years or 100 years ahead, and then to see you know, how our climate may change in response to the human influence that we exert on the climate system. I also heard you do some other exciting work. You use ocean models and ocean circulation to simulate fish larvae and to simulate how little eels, I think that is, make it into Europe from the Saragossa Sea. How does that work? Yes, uh, so if, if we uh, consider little turtles, uh, for instance, or fish larvae, uh, they all use the ocean currents, okay? They are passengers uh, uh, in, in the world ocean. And so they, they use these currents like the Gulf Stream, for instance, you know, to get away uh, from, uh, say, uh, the east coast of the Americas, uh, 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 heading uh, uh, eastward toward Europe. And little turtles, for instance, uh, uh, some of them, uh, they, they uh, actually uh, wind up at the Azores Islands, okay, and there they grow up, okay, and then if they are mature enough, you know, they return, and we use uh, the models to understand, you know, how their life cycle actually is, because we can't, because we can't really follow them all around, and you know, with the aid of ocean models, you know, we get further insight uh, in, in, into the whole uh, life cycle. Fascinating. I think we're learning that the stands of models and observations together really allows us to develop predictive capabilities of the ocean. We can use it to think about aiding mariners on their ways crossing the ocean basins to get the most efficient routes, avoiding recurrence. We can use it for seasonal climate forecasting like El Nino and other phenomena, monsoon system maybe, and also for climate change. But we also can try to understand how the circulation influences the ecosystem, how our climate involves on long timescales. Fascinating stuff, Mojib. Thank you.